Well, good morning, guys. It's James here from Channel 10 Security. Thank you for um, re-registering -regist re for today's webinar. We'll be covering off um, in today's session the Access Communication Product Roadmap. So this is actually a, a focus on what David, Lemon and I covered when we were over at the um, Access Singapore conference a couple of weeks ago. So what was really cool about the conference is that on a whole, they didn't just focus on new product. They looked at some, cheers Darren, <laughs> glad you um, all the audio sorted on your end. So the really cool thing with the, um, the Singaporean conference is that they, they covered off a number of things, a number of high level things, and then they really got down to the weeds in regards to certain new products and the reason why these new products are really exciting as well. So today we're going to cover off basically this two days worth of content and we're going to cram it into about 40 minutes. So in the conference, they covered off the growths and trends of IP technology. They did a significant bit on cybersecurity. Then they focused on smart or safe cities, retail, and then of course the new access products as well. And we can see Winston on the left here, he is the head of marketing in our APAC region as well. So growth and trends of IP technology. So Bodil, the um, VP of Global Sales at Access Communications, took us through the Access interpretation of the market trends for IP technology. Now, this is an important factor, um, as you'll notice in the, in the graph sort of that she's demonstrating here. IP has almost hit a saturation point in video technology. We know this in the New Zealand market, we've seen a lot of movement away from analog into IP. The significance here is that the conversation isn't, you know, do we go analog, do we go IP? It's just a, it's a no brainer for most people. However, this does raise a point. If we're looking at sort of our market and we're looking at opportunities in our market, we either have to do two things. We have to grow our market in a different way. We have to find the problems and solve different problems with, with our same solution, or we look at the next big trend in IP technology. And for those who know Axis pretty well, Axis does not see itself as a surveillance company. It sees itself as an IP technology company or an IT company. So the first bit, which I'll actually cover off later in the presentation, is looking at the augmentation of existing IP video solutions through the use of analytics and solution-based promotions or you know, solution-based solutions, design-based solutions. This also focuses on, and I'll cover this often in cybersecurity, the divergence between the eye, a camera simply just being just that, an eye that just shows you what's happening, and the brain, where you can actually load up analytics and programs onto your camera to generate that solution to meet the needs of the customer. The other big thing, the other big trend outside of video, as far as access is concerned, is audio. So as you'll notice in this photo, you can see that there's a couple of things that touch on audio. We're looking at IP telephony, we're looking at network, we're looking at background music, especially background music and public address. There is a very small amount of IP technology. This means that with progression into the network, we are seeing um, more and more opportunities in this realm for, for IP technology. And it's a pretty it's a pretty competitive reason as well. When you think about it, with, with IP, you can run multiple different solutions over the same blue cable. We're seeing in our schools through the SNUP program, more and more schools have access to high-speed internet, which means they also have access to really good network infrastructure. And if we think about IP audio, this would actually give us the ability to both run our public address and our background music across the same cable and therefore also the same hardware as well. For those who are aware, Axis purchased a, uh, an audio company, audio um, specialist in the IP audio a couple of years ago. The company was 2N. And if you've dealt with Channel 10 before, you'll know that we obviously carry both Axis and 2N products as well. So 2N don't just make really good intercoms, they also make IP audio solutions. And this is one of the reasons why uh, Axis acquired them, as they saw this 
progression in this trend. And you will see with um, some of the products like the speakers, the SIP speakers, the net speakers, and also the decoders as well, those realm of products are coming through into the Axis suite. So it's, a, it's an interesting sort of progression. There are a lot of opportunities and in this, in this sort of massive sort of rate of change at the moment. And for those systems integrators who are interested in taking it on, then you can obviously promote the use of your network infrastructure and get more out of that infrastructure you might be putting in. The, unfortunately, when it does, when you do look at the overarching conversation around audio, it's important to recognize that there is an exceptionally steep learning curve. So what I mean by that is when it comes to providing a solution for both designing an IP audio solution and also implementing it, you need to have an idea around how you place your speakers, um, the, the, the way it's going to create the sound, where that sound is going to ricochet off soft and hard surfaces. It's a lot more complex than just banging up a speaker. And when we look at those who are going to be successful in this, in this realm of, of products, are those who have access to audio engineers as well as network specialists. Just understanding audio might not be enough if you don't appreciate and understand your network as well. So on the next slide here, we actually have some of the products that were originally in the 2N range and now have come through into the Axis range. Um, don't worry about scribbling this down too much. I will send this presentation out to everybody on the call and also all the links are there for you as well. Now here at Channel 10, we've been working on the audio now for um, uh, at least at least to 12 months. Um, in some cases, the conversation has been happening for about 24. And we've come to appreciate that getting up to speed is like a, it's paramount for us. And we have um, both Stephen Garlick and, and, and Hamish McKenzie have been working very hard on getting up to speed in audio. If anyone on the call has some questions about, um, about audio or has a project that they want to discuss, then please drop me a line at the end and I can put you in touch with the, the right people. Now, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity was a very interesting discussion in Singapore. And I have to say, since I have had um, not been a part of this presentation, I've been going away and talking to people about cybersecurity, and it's, it's really sort of sprung off from there for me. I've started to appreciate that a lot of people are talking about it. But the funny thing is that cybersecurity means different things for different people. So Michael, the uh, BDM for Critical Infrastructure and Transport over in Australia, took us through this presentation. Um, he started off actually showing us a, a piece of software called Sonic Wall, which was actually demonstrating every cyber attack that was happening at that point in time. Um, quite, a, quite a cool little piece of software. I tried actually having a look, but I think I have to get a special license to, to demonstrate that today. I mentioned that cybersecurity means different things for different people, and in some cases it is for some people turning into a bit of a buzzword, but it's important that we actually separate away from that and look at sort of what does it mean. For those dealing with network infrastructure, it means locking down access for your system and making sure that those who shouldn't have access can't get it or it's particularly difficult to get it. And the reason why this is more important than ever as we are putting on more and more devices onto our network. By doing this, we actually increase the risk of exploitation. We are benefiting from that blue cable, but we are unfortunately giving more people more opportunity to get access to our systems. So what is the risk? The risk is, is somewhat difficult to quantify as it does depend on the type of organization you represent. But if you think of yourself as, a, as an end user, or even if you think of yourself as a homeowner who might have some cameras, or a business owner who has uh, an IP surveillance solution, or even a government department, you do have a responsibility to yourself to protect yourself, to protect your employees and their information, and of course to protect your customers or anyone you might have a fiduciary obligation for, such as your citizens as well. The important thing when we're talking about protection, when we're talking about data, it's not just about video data. 
for instance, if someone can get access to your surveillance solution, of course, they'll get access to your cameras, your live view cameras, and also the recorded footage. But it's not just about that. It's about any information that could be accessible across multiple devices and across multiple networks. There's been a couple of high profile attacks over in North America where people or hackers have had been able to get access through HVAC systems and through a series of elimination, then get access to the POS information. So that's quite, that's quite a process for them, but they did end up getting very valuable information about people's credit card details and obviously that can have quite a significant impact. In the New Zealand instance, I have personally been talking to a number of systems integrators and end users. And the interesting thing I've found, if I could sort of sum it up in, in one comment, is that the community is talking. The community is more educated than ever. There are people who would like to say they're not very technically savvy, but when you dive into it, they're going into their systems. These are end users. They're going into their systems, they're looking at their logs, and in certain types of systems, they can see that their solution has been compromised. I've even had chats to people about certain types of solutions. Um, for those who follow the, the forums, IPVM and such, you'll know some of the solutions I'm mentioning, where they've been able to go in and actually look and see that people have played with their systems. Now, these could just be opportunistic hackers, or they could be individuals trying to compromise the solution to to rob them or, or do some do some harm now there was a couple of common mistakes that were that were brought out um, and the really cool thing is that michael actually takes us through some ways to harden these mistakes as well but i actually found it quite interesting that the the mistakes fell into two buckets hardware and human so the hardware one was, was quite interesting. It, it covers off the importance of identifying with mature partners. And I'll cover that off in the, in the next slide. The human one was quite interesting as well, because what you'll notice here in the human element is that every common mistake has a human component. So someone, for instance, hasn't changed the default passwords, or there's been poor physical protection. Um, it could be that in every instance, actually, funnily enough, the passwords need to be addressed. But there is no network isolation. They haven't put in VPNs or firewalls or anything like that. And there hasn't been an audit of the entire solution. This makes us think, I mean, I'm sure we're all guilty of this, of using the same password more than once. But if we think about our customers, our end users, how many common passwords are used across multiple different systems. These are serious vulnerabilities that all it takes is someone who knows these passwords to be able to get access to people's systems. Now, to go back to the hardware point first, one thing I took away from the, the access seminar was the importance of if you buy an access camera, you're getting an access camera. Now, that's it's a little bit cliche, but what it means is that access manufactures its own chipsets. Now, this is getting a little bit technical, but Access are responsible for the brain that is inside their cameras. And this means that if there's a problem with the firmware, um, there's a problem, a vulnerability that's been detected, Access have a dedicated R&D team that responds to that problem, fixes it, communicates it to the community and sends out the fix. And that's really important. It's important that they're transparent, that there is a, a problem that's been identified and they're able to respond and fix it straight away. Now, there are a number of brands in our community who don't manufacture their own cameras or their own chipsets. And this raises a huge problem around whose responsibility is it to fix a vulnerability. So if a company manufactures a chipset and another company slaps its name on it and then sends it to market, if there's an issue identified with the firmware, who's going to fix it? By the time that that discussion has happened, by the time that a resolution has been found, it could be months down the track, and this many systems can be, can be compromised along the way. So a very important factor when looking at um, aligning with mature partners, making sure they're transparent, making sure they're quick to react, and that was a really powerful part out of this presentation. 
to go back to the human element, what's really cool about Axis and also Milestone as well is that they've taken this, this concept of, okay, you know, humans can make mistakes. How can we harden this? And they put out a hardening guide. They've also put through a couple of other resources as well. I provided the link at the bottom of this presentation. Don't worry about writing it down. I'll, I'll send it out. This is basically a checklist, and it starts off with exceptionally easy things, such as changing username and passwords, right through to renewing certificates and the getting down the weeds of cybersecurity. These are all human things, and these are all things that we can all do right now. We don't have to create new services. We don't have to create new programs. We can do this both in the installation and also in the maintenance of our systems. Now, I'm not sure if um, everyone has dealt with the Access Device Manager, but this is a bit of a conversation around, okay, how do I update my firmware? How can I do it as quickly as possible? And how can I mitigate the, the conversations around updating firmware? So we've all heard these excuses before, why we shouldn't update our firmware. I mean, we might not need the additional features. I don't do it. Why do I, I don't do it with the Dolby? Why would I do it with Axis? And it's expensive, especially if I have to send out a technician and I can't justify the cost because they haven't paid for a maintenance agreement. So these are all, these are all comments that are made. And one way that Axis has tackled this is with the release of the Axis Device Manager. Now, the Axis Device Manager is a tool that allows you to, en masse, on the network that you're on, install Axis cameras, change IP addresses, and configure them, and also maintain them as well. Now, on the next slide, this is, I apologize for the quality of this one here, but it's, it's quite powerful. It shows you on the left how much time it's going to take you to configure 200 devices manually. It includes the installation, the upgrade of your firmware, any deployments of certificates, and also the configuration and hardening. On the right, we have the time using the Access Device Manager. And it is quite significantly different. We're looking at 130 hours worth of time versus around about 35 minutes. For anyone who's actually set up access cameras and gone through the manual process of setting IP addresses, you know that it's quite tiresome. The fact you can do this in one platform is it's very simple. It's, it's not that revolutionary. It, it's just good practice. So in, real, in sort of summing up around the whole sort of cybersecurity cyber policy, there are two common areas, hardware and human, that we need to address. The really cool thing is that we can address the human now. When it comes to hardware, you know, aligning with transparent partners and mature partners is very important. And if your technicians aren't already using Access Device Manager, I'd strongly suggest that they do. Now onto a very hot topic at the moment, smarter cities. Marie, the strategy and business development manager in Access Singapore, took us through the sort of idea, the lay of the land of the, the smart cities at the moment. The um, really interesting thing that I took away from this presentation is the growth and adoption of IP technology in the whole smart city conversation. And this is important because we are talking about public enterprises. And the unfortunate reality with public enterprises is that even though they might have this amazing infrastructure, they do have a tendency to be exceptionally siloed. So we might have the same infrastructure, but we might have it, the same job being done multiple times. And the really unique selling proposition about an IP solution is that we can basically do a number of things and just do it, just do it once. The other big takeaway from, from this presentation is the growth in solution selling. So Axis are a huge player in the surveillance industry, and they're a huge player in IP technology, yet they are still just a very small part, or we are a very small part of a very big picture. There are multiple different systems running on the same blue cable, and ultimately the, the video, if we're talking simply just about surveillance and the camera, is just one part of a much bigger beast. So where can Axis's range of products play a role 
and the sort of smarter cities scape. The obvious area is safety and security. It's pretty straightforward. We know we're going to be using a camera. We're going to collect information on an event as it happens and then review it at a later date. The other cool thing as well, with the use of analytics in the safety and security realm, we are able to actually be more responsive. So we're seeing the, um, the use of sound detection. It's not a new uh, analytic, but it is coming through more and more. We are looking at um, obviously facial recognition as a solution. And what we're seeing here is that whole solution selling. We're seeing a camera, we're seeing an analytical package sitting in the middle, and then we're seeing an outcome. There is often a human element involved, but the big discussion around analytics is that it minimizes the amount of the human interaction we need, which is in many cases more cost effective for our customers. In some sort of less obvious areas, we have traffic and parking. Now, a really cool thing that was talked about in Maria's presentation around traffic and parking was a company called CityLog. I've provided the link below. Now, CityLog is a company that was purchased by Axis about two years ago. 2016. I haven't personally dealt with them, but the discussion was quite interesting. They invented an analytical platform that will actually do crash detection. So it will look at specifically in tunnels when a crash has happened and then have an, uh, a generated alarm, an outcome, which is quite often the case with most of these analytics. So it's coming back to that, we've got an analytic, we're augmenting our existing system or we're building a system around this to create a certain outcome. Now, lastly, the, the more hidden away area that we can deal with is to do with the environmental aspect. We are seeing um, a big progression, a big focus from a governmental level of thinking about the impact that we have on our environment and what we can do to minimize it. The other question is, how can we use our solutions that we provide as distributors or vendors or systems integrators to help address this issue as well? So this is going to be an area that more and more work is going to be done. Uh, it's about being part of the conversation as well. So you might find that trying to focus on what the problem is then coming back to us or going back to the vendors and saying, do we have anything that can address that is the best way to get that ball rolling. And the other difficult thing, and there are people on the call who are much better at this than I, is getting these different groups of people together and get them talking, especially if they're significantly siloed. <clears throat> Retail. Now, Trevor Westhead from over in Australia, and he's the BDM of Retail and Access over there, took us through an exceptionally passionate presentation on retail. And if you ever talk to Trevor, he is very, very passionate about retail. It's it's quite quite a quite an intoxicating sort of conversation when you're sort of talking to about retail with him. And the, the interesting thing that we took away in relation to, to retail is the changing conversation from security into business optimization. And then the important part here is when how these conversations happen. In the past, people have often come to me and said, great, we've got an existing security solution. We want to get someone else's budget out of sales and marketing and then use that to justify a security solution. That's... That's all right and, and well, but the problem is if anyone's actually installed a people counting camera, as it is often pointing straight down, you get a lovely shot on the tops of people's heads. You don't necessarily get some forensic information you could use for loss prevention, but you do count them as they come through the door. So that conversation is switching. We are now sort of focusing on business optimization first, and with some retailers, security second. This is giving us the opportunity to talk to retailers who had never even considered installing a surveillance solution, or if they're installing a surveillance solution, it is literally bottom dollar. So where does this whole conversation start? Ultimately, it starts with data. We need to be able to track our consumer's behavior, understand how they're purchasing, why they're purchasing, when they're purchasing, who's the people who are actually doing the purchasing, get this information to divulge insights into how we should make our products, how effective our advertising campaigns are, or how well are we using our environment. 
an important thing to, to think about here, and it was quite interesting, there was a, a very black and white discussion uh, that happened on the panel that followed this around whether we should be focusing on clicks online, ordering online, e-commerce portals, or bricks, physical retail of spaces. I personally don't think it's as black and white, and the people I've talked to after this conversation agree. When it comes down to it, there are some businesses that require a physical presence in their business model. However, space, physical space, rental space can be one of the most expensive parts of running a business. So ultimately, the conversation around retail analytics is we have an expensive space. How can we use it as effectively as possible to get the most out of it? So for those who have dealt with the range of analytics before, there are some familiar faces. We have Access People Counter, Q Monitor, Demographic Identifier. There's also a couple of other ones like Occupancy Estimator and also the Store Reporter. Now, Store Reporter is a dashboard that actually takes every site that has been connected up to the net and pulls that information into a single dashboard that you can break down in a way that, that benefits you. For those who have um, dealt with me, they will know, or they should know, that I um, have done quite a bit of work around the people counting analytics and also around, um, quite recently, the demographic identifier as well. People counting is very straightforward. Demographic identifier is the ability to have a camera that's often at the front of the door or near a point of sale or near an advertising campaign that will pick up people's faces and tell you their general bracket of age and also their gender as well. So quite a useful tool when you want to look at, okay, people coming in my door, who are they? People who actually purchase something and then comparing those two pieces of information to see what your attrition rate is along the way. Now, the important thing to think about when it comes to retail analytics is that most, most of us are coming from a space of loss prevention or surveillance, and it can be somewhat difficult if we haven't had a marketing or sales marketing experience to quantify the value of this data. And that's also the same for our customers, or at least our traditional customers, so our loss prevention managers, our security managers. They are very excited about the concept of taking other people's budgets to, to use to benefit their systems, but they might not necessarily be able to quantify the value of the data. In these instances, I would suggest that you think about who your audience is, making sure you're getting in front of the right people and getting advice around whether or not they collect this information already, whether it's useful and whether or not they're engaged and interested in collecting it in a more, maybe a more useful and meaningful way. And especially, this is can't be said enough, presenting it in a really attractive, easy to understand fashion, that's where the Access Store Reporter plays its part. So that's all the high level conversation. These are all the things that Access are focusing on, and the importance of certain elements and, and their overall strategy. With that strategy comes the products. Now, I've broken up this product range into two areas, released, and not released. Released doesn't necessarily mean that we have it in New Zealand right at this point in time. It does mean that it's been officially released, it's on the Access website, and we've highly likely put it in order for it. So if you're interested in any of these products, please touch base with your uh, Channel 10 representative, touch base with me, and then we can, we can go from there to get you a bit more information and also an idea on price and lead time. So the product roadmap, um, I tried to actually take it product roadmap from different presentations, put them all here in one place, it was taken by Chris. Now Chris is from Singapore, not Singapore, sorry, he's from Thailand, and he's the engineering and training manager. He has a certain flair when it comes to his presentations, a lot of videos. Unfortunately, we are on time pressure today, so I can't unfortunately show you those, but if you're looking for a laugh, I can flip them your way at a later date. Before we actually look at the actual products and the new stuff that's coming out. Chris took us through the progression over time of access cameras. And one trend that you're gonna see across all of their range is an increasing image quality at low light. WDR, or wide dynamic range, is the ability to take a couple of images at different sort of light in your, in your area and then balance them to give you a crisp, or as crisp as possible, color image rather than just going straight to infrared and giving you a black and white image. 
You'll notice in the bottom right hand corner we have an old Q1602. Quite dark, um, 02, I'm trying to remember the resolution, but I think it's less than 720p. And then as we go from up and then over to the left, you'll see the image quality, well enough, is actually getting better. And we're going to high resolution, we're going to 1080p cameras. This is the really cool thing about Axis is that they have generated these analytics like LightFinder that will be able to, and forensic capture as well, that can take high resolution camera, which is ultimately spreading light over more pixels and still give us a crisp, high quality color image, which in many cases is more useful than a black and white image. Now getting into the products, I um, just want to put a massive disclaimer over this one at the moment. It is not available in New Zealand. <laughs> just want to say that clearly first because I got some people very excited in our last presentation. Axis are releasing a license plate recognition camera or a license plate verifier. The important thing is that the license plate recognition, the LPR, is being decoded on the camera side. This shows us that obviously Axis are putting a lot of effort into their chipsets. They're becoming a lot more powerful and therefore being able to actually decode an image and then put it into text. Now these cameras are being released overseas first, so we won't see them in our market for quite a while. I don't have a timeline for this, but I think it's important that we all know that Axis is working on this and we should hopefully see it coming through soon. Now for those who don't know, New Zealand is actually quite a special case. We have over 20 license plate libraries, which can make it quite difficult when actually decoding those license plates. So it's an interesting space. We have solutions at the moment which we can provide you, and ho hopefully in the next uh, little while we'll actually see the Axis camera come through into our market. Now for those who have dealt with Axis Perimeter Defender, Axis, or for those who haven't, Axis Perimeter Defender is an analytic that when used with a thermal camera especially, is able to detect as a person or as a animal or as a vehicle comes into our space, exclude the ones that we're not interested in and focus on the ones that we are. The really cool thing is that Axis Perimeter Defender has been given a bit of a, bit of a facelift. We can now detect up to 600 meters using the Axis Q1941 with a 60 mil lens. We can now couple this with a PTZ to be able to track as that say person comes into our space and still ultimately generate our alarms and outcomes depending on this as well. So for those who've actually seen Perimeter Defender, it's, it's quite a powerful analytic. It is camera side so that when it comes to the outcome, you can have your outcome coming from your VMS side or you can come in, have it coming directly from the camera to your bullhorns, to your alarm panels, to whatever you want to actually hook up to those IOs. Now this is particularly niche. This is the Axis D201. It is a classic Q6055 PTZ that has been popped into an intrinsically safe housing. So very niche, very specific to when you're dealing with volatile environments. It's um, one of those cameras that it's quite interesting it, it's, we now have it because before when it came to PTZs we had to get a bit of a swivel arm, it was quite a bulky unit. So we're actually reducing the amount of real estate we need to, to put in an intrinsically safe PTZ and in a more traditional fashion as well. If you have any questions about this, I know it is very niche and there's a lot more detail than what we can cover right now. Please touch base with me and we can go from there. Now, this is a particularly exciting one. The Q6125-LE. Now, for those who are particularly savvy when it comes to access naming conventions, the L stands for infrared. This is a Q61 PTZ. It's 1080p with 30 times optical zoom, and it's got built-in discrete IR, which means that you can't see where the IR is pointing. It's using all the same accessories that you've got with your Q61 series. That is above horizon PTZ and the IR is, is pretty cool. We're really excited to get one of these in and, and test it, have it in our environment and actually see how it works. But one of the things that's really interesting about the, P, about the IR with the Q6125 is that it has three individual LEDs, 
which throw different lights at different distances. As we can see here, we've got the first LED throwing a wide, and then the middle LED throwing a mid. There's actually another LED which will throw even longer, and we can light, light these up to meet our environment. The outcome is we're getting a much more usable image. As we'll see on the right, we're throwing a, a wide and a mid, which is actually showing us that there is somebody in the distance. On the left, we're actually using a different brand of PTZ, which is unable to do this. So it's very human-centric, it's very customer-focused in its ability to generate a solution that is going to actually give us a usable image. Now, for our retailers, we have a slightly different sort of solution here. This is the M30, 15, and 16. This is actually a revamp of an older model. It is a recessed mounted camera. And I found this quite interesting. I haven't actually dealt that much with recessed mounted cameras. And the main sort of unique selling proposition of this is that it comes in a four by three shot. And because it's recessed mounted, you're able to optimize your real estate when you're dealing with a surface mounted camera, you've got about an inch or an inch and a half of real estate that you, you can't cover. And this is, can be quite problematic when you're dealing with a very low ceiling. This way we can actually mount directly to the ceiling, flush to the ceiling, and give us as much real estate as possible. So if you're dealing in a case where it's got a particularly low ceiling and it's an indoor retail environment, this is definitely a camera you should consider. Now, the Axis M30, 57, and 58. Notice the naming convention again. P stands for panoramic. L stands for infrared light. V, vandal resistant. And E, external. This is the whole package. We have an externally rated 360 degree camera. In the 58, we have a true panomorphic lens. And of course, it's got built in IR. We've got one of these guys installed in our office at the moment, and I have to say the image is incredibly crisp. It's a um, great little great little fish eye, and we can see with the optimized IR, it delivers us an incredibly crisp image in IR as well. So if anyone has any questions or they actually want to see this, this little guy in the flesh, as I said, we have one installed in our office, we can always organize a remote session, or you can come and check it out yourself. Now, Audio. Axis have released the T61 audio and interface kit. This is an interesting solution, especially in, in our market when we're dealing with um, recorded audio. It allows you to hook up this unit to an M30 series camera, M3045 for instance, and from there interface with a Axis microphone. So if you've got a solution where you didn't previously have um, the ability to record audio and now you need to, you can, on an M30 series, you can now add this little unit. We should hopefully see this come through into compatibility with other cameras as well. I have some questions around whether it would work with the P32 series. The other thing as well is it does have IOs. So if you are looking for IO integration, there is a possibility we could use this um, to, to gain that IO integration, especially if you're dealing and circumstances in retail where you've got an electronic article system, the little badges that beep as you go through. Now you can hook it up to a T6112 um, microphone. There are some higher end microphones as well and I have had a chat to the guys at Axis and I do believe that those still will be supported with this unit. Now another disclaimer before those people get really excited, this is another unit that's being released in North America and Japan first due to the fact that it's using the Z-Wave frequency. Now, Z-Wave is a frequency that's quite common in home automation, Wi-Fi frequency, and once we actually have some support here in New Zealand, we might see this camera coming through. But still, it is important to recognize because it is a very neat camera. The M5065 is the first camera to come with wireless IOs. It also is one of the first cameras to have the Canon analytics on board. I'm talking screen detection, volume, detection and removed object detection as well. So an important trend, even though it's not necessarily being released in our market, we are seeing some of these Canon analytics coming into the Axis cameras. We're also seeing Axis cameras coming out with onboard analytics. So watch the space is all I can say in this respect. There are some accessories in the Z-Wave range as well. I 
got really excited when I saw these because I was thinking about my own place, but unfortunately not supported in our region. Now, onto the not yet released, the roadmap. So when it comes to these products, um, uh, we don't necessarily have an idea on lead time. Some of them will be available at the end of the year, some will be available in 2019. So if it's something that you're really excited about, we will keep you up to date as we get more information. Now the P3717, P-L-E. For those who have used the P3707, you'll notice there's a lot of similarities. But the P3717 has been given a huge upgrade. We now can support frame rates up to 30 frames per second. The lens types, which was a previously a quad view, sort of you got that one you've got to manually sort of twist and, and change around, are motorized. So a lot easier in the setup. It comes with built-in infrared, which just gives us a bit more functionality, especially if you've been using these types of cameras in car parks, They've been particularly popular, because obviously with this camera, you've got four sensors you can adjust and give you that coverage. Now you can flood that area with infrared. In saying that, it does come with forensic wide dynamic range. Forensic wide dynamic range is the highest range of um, WDR. And for those who are seeing that trend now through the access cameras, we're getting really high quality image and images in quite low light. It's coming through in this camera as well. Lastly, it's smaller. So we're going from about 305 mil right down to around 250 mil. So it's a much smaller real estate. It does come recess mounted, but to go back to the, um, the motorized lens types, we are able to pan, tilt, and roll. So we can get a lot more coverage with our sensors than we could previously. Now, this is a really small change, um, but it will have a big impact for those who are dealing in retail, especially if you're looking at bookmarking based on that electronic article recognition technology. The P3225 is getting IOs. This means it will support audio and It'll also support I.O. integration. So very specific change. We probably won't be seeing it until the end of the year. But for those who are dealing in that retail environment who want to bookmark into a milestone platform, when somebody comes through that space and a tag goes off, this is a particularly cool camera to have at your front door. If anyone has any questions about that, I've got an application for that, please touch base with me and let me know. Now, this is another small change that could have a big impact if your end user has existing lighting trap mounts. So this is the T91A33. It is an accessory that allows you to mount your camera to a lighting trap mount. I have a feeling it is limited to the M30 series at the moment. It might be P32, but um, if you have any questions around that touch base, I don't think it's um, even any information has been released online yet. But we should hopefully see that coming through soon. And of course, in the bottom left-hand corner, these are all the brands that this lighting track mount will work with. Now, this is quite an interesting camera. The, the P9106-B. This is a corner-mounted camera that is extremely robust. The example here that was actually used was actually in an elevator. But in any situation where you've got a tight, confined space that you need an exceptionally robust corner mount camera, perhaps you're looking at a correctional application, this is one to consider. We don't have a lot of information on it at the moment, whether or not it's just a revamp of the existing corner mount camera, but we should hopefully be seeing some more very soon. Now, I think this might be the last one. This is, this is a particularly cool camera. This is the P3807. The interesting thing about the P3807 is, funny enough, again, the naming convention, P, panora uh, panoramic, V, vandal resistant, and E, external. For those who have dealt with these types of cameras before, it might look very similar to the Q3708, and a very similar, um, very, very similar sort of naming convention. The big difference between these models is that this camera, the P3807, delivers a single stream stitched together to your VMS. With the other multi-sensor cameras, unfortunately, it did generate individual streams that you'd have to either A, stitch together yourself on the server side, 
or just set up with individual tiles in, say, your milestone platform. This is actually going to take those images from those four sensors, stitch them together, and give you that incredibly crisp, high quality, high detail image. Unlike a fisheye, it's not stretching the image. It is actually generating you four individuals and then plugging them together. So it is a P-series. Um, for those who know, Q-series is top of the range, P-series is more mid-range. Yet it is still coming out with forensic wide dynamic range. It is running Zipstream, which is very important with these high resolution cameras as well. And there is an optimizer for Milestone. So we'll see how that interfaces with Milestone when it comes out. Obviously, if everyone on the call should know, we are also a distributor of Milestone uh, video management software and systems. So we'll definitely be checking that in the system the moment we get one. The other neat thing about this camera, and I haven't got a slide in this presentation, is it comes with some really funky accessories. One in particular allows you to actually take two of these cameras and mount them back to back. So you're getting a 360 degree high quality image, two megapixel, two eights on either side, eight megapixel. So it's incredibly, incredibly awesome coverage. And it, when it comes down to the quality of the image, it's gonna be a very high quality image as well, being eight megapixels on every side. So that's everything. Thank you so much for attending today's presentation. We ran a little bit over time. So if anyone has any questions, I'm just gonna check you, I'm gonna unmute you, and um, I'm also gonna stop recording now as well, just so um, any of your questions remain confidential to this forum.